I'm going to record, I'm going to record locally because I think that might be a factor. Um, she's, she, she's dropped out. Ah. Probably coming back in a minute. Um, here she come. She's here now. She just come back in. Okay. I think. Hi, right, Joan. You dropped out, so I think you're back with us again. Joan, um, you are muted still. Are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, yeah, you still have um, the, the cost and function. I don't know if you want to um, start again because I'm recording now to local. I'm wondering what, what might have happened there. <laughs> Not too sure. Then. So it's as, as soon as I say share screen, what it comes up to you with your Zoom account, and then it, it throws me out of it. So I sent you the, a copy of the presentation. Okay. Would it be easier for you to do it? Okay, so let me go and see if I can go back to that then. Um... So similar to what happened with Amadou, it throws you out um, and then it, it automatically mutes. So it takes my, it puts me on mute and then it puts my, stops my video as well. Okay, let me um, I'll go to... Uh... Yeah, that's what we want to see. Perfect. Okay, so would you be able to do there you go? So so you'll have to be my co-presenter. So that's uh, yeah. <laughs> so so essentially what we do is we go around the country and talk about the Windrush and where how the home offices approached it and um how we can help people. So thank you so much for the invitation. Um uh, it was very interesting looking at our whackers actually operating and it was really nice to see that you're thriving really well. And out of the what I took out, I sort of noticed that you said, together we can achieve more. And I just thought that's really interesting because as a community, um, it's important for us to strive to achieve uh, the end result. So if you just want to go on to the slide, second slide. So before we do the presentation, I think it might be interesting to sort of do a, a background so when we talk about Windrush, automatically everybody thinks about the ship that landed in Tilbury Dock in 21st of January 1948, and it was the HMT Empire Windrush. So essentially what the background is that the the after the Second World War, um, Britain made a call out to all the Commonwealth countries to actually come back and rebuild the country. So... It's an, when it started, it, it, the, the date that we start from is 21st of June, 1948, but it does go on further on. So we've got pe uh, people from the British, sub who were British subjects or citizens of the United Kingdom and Colony that traveled into the UK. And when they entered the UK, they had freed, free movement. There were no immigration restrictions. But what happened then, there was a change in the, as, as the immigration rules have come along, the, these individuals that we call the Windrush generation have been impacted. So the first key one was, um, sort of the third paragraph says, Commonwealth citizens settled in the UK on 1st of January, 1973, were automatically granted indefinitely to remain in the UK by virtue of the Immigration Act 1971. So we use the term ILR, which is a stamp that would naturally go into somebody's passport or another form. And it basically says that you've got settled state status. And when we use the word settled status, it means that you are uh, you consider as, as a settled resident of the UK with no, no restrictions. So these documents, what, what, the, what we're finding is the problem is that people that enter the UK 
they weren't they were automatically granted these stamps but not not a lot of people were aware of them they weren't aware that they'd been granted it and they weren't aware of the the pros and cons of it so what we're finding is that as as people's your country of your birth became independent then there was a requirement for people to actually the winter generation to apply for citizenship a lot of people have told us in the 80s that there was a, a massive publicity where um, people were applying for the citizenship um, many people weren't aware that they it was it was essential that they applied for it and therefore some people did and some people didn't people that didn't apply for it are the ones that have been caught up in the windrush what we call the windrush scandal and that's where um due to immigration controls further and then um success, success i can't use the word uh, all the governments that say it's a successive governments they introduce uh, measures to combat immigration and illegal immigrants so through that because the because the windrush generation or individuals that we call windrush generation they'd not got this evidence evidence that they've got indefinite leave to remain or a stamp in the passport then they were caught up in in this scandal and the measures so some lost their jobs and some lost back access to benefits and healthcare, etc cetera, etc cetera. so in 2008 the home office set up a um, task force um, which is in sheffield and what we've done we've tried our best to actually help people essentially first to get the documents to prove that they've got status in the uk and then further to do a compensation scheme so can you go to the next slide? So that's about the background of how Windrush came about. So what we're going to talk to you about today is, we're gonna talk about the two, two elements of it. So we've got the status scheme, which is about the documents that you need and how we've helped people and, and what we can offer individuals to show that they've, they've got a right to work and live in the UK. Then we'll talk about the compensation scheme. And within the, that talk, we will talk about um, who's eligible, um, the categories that you can claim for, um, the claim assistance, um, and the support that we offer from a vulnerable persons team, and then how to apply. So let's see if you can play this video. I Th think this video is always a sticking point, so. Hi, my name is David, and I'm part of the... Sorry, Windrush. can you hear the sound? My name is yeah. David, and I'm part of our response to Windrush. Many people who settle lawfully in the UK before the end of 1988 have the right to live and work here. But some do not have the correct documents to show this. As a result, they may have found it hard to demonstrate their right to work and access services in the UK. Two schemes have been set up to right the wrongs they experienced the win risk scheme and the win risk compensation scheme. Applications to both are free. The win risk teams will treat everything you tell them with sensitivity and care. Nothing you tell us will be passed on to immigration enforcement. The Windrush scheme was set up to help people get the documents they need to demonstrate their right to live and work in the UK. If you have any questions about the Windrush scheme, you can call the helpline for free on 0800 678 1925. They can offer support, guidance, and information on, on how to apply. The second scheme is called the Win Risk Compensation Scheme. It is designed to compensate. Oh. Sorry. Oh. You come back. That's okay. So, I, I mean, I can finish off there and say Hi, the compensation. And I'm part of the Win to help people get the documents they need to demonstrate their right to live and work in the UK. If you have any questions about the Windrush scheme, you can call the helpline for free on 0800 678 1925. They can offer support, guidance and information on, on how to apply. The second scheme is called the Windrush Compensation Scheme. It is designed to compensate people who suffered or lost out on things because they couldn't demonstrate their right to live in the UK. If this describes your experience, you can claim for things like loss of earnings, 
loss of access to benefits, medical costs, and the broader impact this has had on your lives. Ultimately, we want to make sure you get the compensation you deserve for the difficulties you have faced. More information on both schemes, included eligibility, can be found on gov.uk forward slash Windrush, or you can call the Windrush helpline for free on 0800 678 1925. Thank you so much for that. So can we go to the next slide? If you just skip that, January does that. So next slide. Hi, my name is David. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So I think this one is that that's the one. That's the one. So we're gonna go on to my colleague Lorraine and we're gonna talk about the Winter State status scheme. Hello everybody. Unfortunately, my camera's not working. Um, so with regards to the status scheme, it sets out who can apply. We would like to stipulate that should you need to make an application for status, if you do it through Windrush and you are eligible, the items will be free. You can apply for these items separately, um, but you will have to pay for them um, if you're not eligible through the scheme. So one of the points is Commonwealth citizens that settled in the UK by 1973 and their children who were born here or came under the age of 18 and have continued to live here. We have people that came, any other person who arrived in the UK by 1989 who is now settled and Commonwealth citizens that arrived by 1973, but who are no longer settled in the UK, may also make an application for free to return to live in the UK, but they must have close and continuing ties to the UK. So that would be family. So if the parents left and they left their children behind, that's close continuing ties and traveling back to visit their children and grandchildren. Currently, um, we've helped over 16,000 800 people with documentation to confirm their status as a British citizen. So for, again, for lawful status, this means that they will have need indefinite leave to remain or enter, the right to abode or British citizenship. The types of documents, this all depends on when you entered the UK and your individual circumstances. But under Windrush, we can provide a document confirming you are already a British citizen, which would be a status letter, British citizenship, which is naturalisation or a registration certificate, a document confirming that you have the right to abode in the UK, so it'll be a certificate of entitlement, a document confirming that you have the right to live in the UK permanently, which is currently a BRP card, but that will be changing to an e-visa by the end of the year. If you know someone that this affects, or you can identify somebody within your community, please get in contact with us. And we're at the end of this slide, there are contact information. We have a telephone number, we have an email address. Even anybody living abroad, they can make contact and there is an online form for them to complete to see if they are eligible. Next slide, please. Back to you, Jo. Thank you so much, Lorraine. So um, just summarising what um, Lorraine said, sort of there's, there's two pockets, but we've got a slide later on that talks about um, people who can apply from different areas. So what, what we've done is, so... So the scheme was set up in April 2018 in Sheffield um, and we had to get, hit the ground running essentially because it was important that the calls that were coming through were identifying that people, because they didn't have this actual piece of document to confirm that they, they'd got a right to live and um, live and work in the UK, they were facing lots of problems. I know personally when I sort of volunteered to join the compensation scheme, I used to go to my my um, seniors in, in, in my community and they used to say, well, nobody would, you're not going to get much response because 
majority of us, we, we all naturalised in the 80s. Um, and then obviously they would say, I want my money back for having to do that. But it was quite funny that when, once I joined, well, it wasn't funny, actually, it was quite traumatic for me. It really changed my life because the calls that were coming through, it just made me realise how important holding on to your immigration documents are. So like your passports, your, your passport that you landed in on, and then also just keeping that up to date. And by no fault of people, no fault of their own, individuals, because they weren't told that the, the rule, immigration rules had changed, that they then were stuck. So what we did is in April 2019, we designed the compensation scheme. And that essentially, as it says on the screen, it's for anybody or any nationalities for, for anybody that came to the UK before 1989. So that's not just for the Commonwealth individuals, it is for anybody that came into the country before 1989. So um, 31st of December, 1988, at midnight, if you were landed in the UK, then and then you've got lawful status and you'd experience a loss, then you could claim for compensation. And what we did is we separated it into two caveats, sorry, three caveats. So as, as you can see on the screen, it says primary claimant. So the primary claimant would be if you had experienced a loss. So we've got examples where people had entered the UK, they'd not applied for the citizenship, and then they travelled abroad. For example, they returned home to family in Jamaica, and then when they tried to re-enter, they were stopped um, from boarding. We would consider that a loss, so you could apply for compensation. So you would be the primary claimant. Under this circumstances, if you had got a family member that was actually, um, would, had been refused boarding and you were supporting them and you you had an impact on that because of that, so you would come under the close family. So if you're the partner, child, brother, sister or parent of someone who would had an issue trying to prove your status, then you could make a claim under the close family member application form. And the third one is, is we understand that by default, because of the um, timing and the years that have passed on, that unfortunately we're going to have had people that have passed away and no, are no longer with us. But if you had a family member that you understood that it had, had an impact because they had a problem trying to prove their status, then as the executor of the estate, you could actually make a claim on their behalf. So can we go to the next slide, please? So who, who can apply? This is where Clive, you'll have to click. So if you keep clicking. So you may be eligible for Winter Scheme if you come from the following countries. Jamaica, Zambia, Keep clicking, Bangladesh, Fiji, Mauritius, St. Lucia, Belize, Australia, South Africa, Hong Kong, Canada, India, Pakistan. Nigeria but that's not all so you can see that there was a quite wide range of countries across there so essentially um, the scheme's been designed so that it says you may be able to apply for a document to prove that you've got a right to live and work in the UK uh, if one of the following is true so on the previous pre presentation we'd got three boxes didn't we so the first one was, if you came from the UK, from a Commonwealth country, before 1973. And then the other caveat was, or your parents came to the UK from a Commonwealth country before 1973. And then it then widens out, because of the immigration rules, and it is an immigration matter, that it covers any country before that you enter the UK before 31st of December, and you are now, now settled here. And I think that third one for us is we're doing our 
presentations and going across the country, that is the biggest surprise to everybody that it is open to the whole world, essentially. And there you go. There's a clip of the world. Right. So, so far, what we do is what we try and do is we try and give you the transparency data. These can be found online. Um, and um, what they, they're basically some figures that shows the, the amount of money we've paid so far. So um, we've dealt with um, a wide range of um you could say over 8,000 people have applied for compensation um, at, at the moment. Well, it's, as of March, 86% of um, the population, oh, sorry, 86% of the claims have received the final decision. On the next box, it shows the difference between the amount paid and then, the, and then what was offered. So essentially what we do is when we receive a claim, we will make an offer and if you are satisfied with that claim, with that final award, you can accept the claim. If you want us to review it and you have the right for it to be reviewed, you can actually send it back and say, I'm not happy with this payment. Can we have a review? So when we have our presentations, there's always going to be a difference between the amount of the overall amount that's been paid out and then the actual um, the amount that's been offered. So that's there, really. And then during the month of May, we have actually um, made a payment of 2.1 million. We do have the day de details out. Uh, so if you go on the .gov.uk website, it um, updates itself every um, every month on the up-to-date data. So slide nine, please. So again, this is an animation. So you've got the primary claimant. So that's the person that it's happened to. And again, the a representative of the estate. So they're basically technically two primary claimants. The only difference is um, one's actually present and able to fill the form in. And then the other one's where you've got the estate of a person that's deceased. But essentially they can claim for all of these categories. What we've done is I'll try our best to actually cover every single scenario. So if you imagine some, if you, if you imagine that you've actually entered the UK, you've been happily living in the UK with no problems, and then all of a sudden, the document that you've got is out of date and not acceptable. So all these areas are the situations that you can be, you can face an issue with. The so we've got the immigration, we've got the immigration fees. We've got uh, employment is the biggest one. And we've done a lot of work with working with listening to people um, where they've had issues and we've made uh, we've made final awards and they're not happy with that final awards. And we've gone back several times to our policy team and revisited it. So when we talk about home office updates, we, we've done quite a lot of work on the employment category. We've done quite a lot of work on the knock on effect of the pension. So essentially when we were making the employment wards, we would start the payment from the loss of earnings from the moment you um, were out of work. And then also it would then, it but then it would end the moment you started working. But that didn't cover people that had got, that were skilled. And then they, as a result of their status, or as a result of their, their not being able to prove their status, they had to take a less less paid job. So we've reviewed the employment um, payment and how we approached it, and we've actually balanced it out where if somebody, even though you started working, but it was a less 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 paid job, that we would actually make that payment in line with your job that you um, were in before your status um, was under question. We've also looked at the homeless section. Essentially, we we had it was capped, so we would only make payments to a certain so a certain time. That's been lifted. Um, and then I think the one the biggest one that I'm always proud of as a because I started in on the scheme in 2018, and then obviously the and then the compensation scheme in 2019 was the impact on life. So when we look at this, when we look at the 
an individual situation. We can cover people for if they've had a problem traveling and a problem applying for the uh, immigration documents. We can um, compensate them for the detention if they're being deported. We can compensate them for homelessness, housing, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially, the, behind that, there's an, the emotional impact that's happened. So if you can imagine that you were perfectly fine before, and then all of a sudden you've had all these issues, a lot of people uh, have not been able to attend family events. They've not been able to apply, um, provide for the family. They've not been able to travel. They've um, had a lot of depression from it. This category in itself deals with that impact it, um, that you've faced, and then we can make an payment towards that. When we first receive an application form, what we do is we try our best to make an assessment as soon as possible. If we can see that there's a that that you have been impacted, and um, that it, it's evident there and we've got documents to prove it. So, for example, if you sent a, a, pay, a letter from your employer saying that, um, that it clearly said we're going to have to dismiss you because you can't prove your status, then we would make what we call a preliminary payment. And that preliminary payment is a minimum of £10,000. So that's what in the video, that's what it was referred to. And then it would go on to the close family. So because the close family, it, it's a, the ripple effect from what's happened to the, the main person, the primary claimant, the close family can only claim for if they've paid immigration fees for somebody, um, if if they've had to be, if they've been supporting them with living cost, and then obviously the impact it's had on them. And on both categories, we've got a discretionary category. So that's if we don't, if you have got a situation that doesn't fit under any of these categories, you can inform us of, um, and present to us that you want us to consider something under the discretionary category. I hope that's clear, um, but we'll take questions after. So next category. So I'll, I'm sorry, it's quite perfect timing for my voice to go. <laughs> So I'll hand over to my colleague, Pauletta, and she'll talk about the claimant assistance providers. Well, have you unmuted yourself? Can you see if Pauletta is unmuted? I can't really see on my... She's unmuted, um, jo Joanne. But she can't hear. Oh. Are you able to continue then? I can, I can definitely continue. So, so essentially what the claimant assistance is, when it comes to the compensation scheme, um, <clears throat> the feedback is that individuals were wanting assistance to actually fill the form in. It was viewed that if the Home Office actually uh, helped someone fill the form in, that then we would have a, we we could be considered as being biased, and we would be marking our own papers. So what we brought in is a, a what we call a claimant assistance provider. If essentially when we first started, it used to be the Assistant Advice Bureau, and then it went to tender, and it's now with an organisation called We Are Group. So what We Are Group, you can contact them. There's a number that we can provide you at the end that we can contact. You can use them, that number, or you can go directly with them. What we all group then do is they help you apply for compensation. They help you do if you need to do your probate um, in the process to apply for compensation. And they will give you a time slot. So they've got um, organisations, um, hubs, hubs all over the country. So you would go to your nearest contact centre, they would help you fill the form in, gather, in the, gather their information and send it into the home office. Uh, and then they would be, um, they would be there to support you. So can we do it to the next slide? I'll pick this one up, Joe. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, within the Windrush team, there is a team called Vulnerable Persons, and their role is to help those people that have been um, made homeless, that are struggling to get access um, NHS or any, any health issues. Um, and what they tend to do is it's a dedicated team of people and they will be in contact with the vulnerable person on a regular basis. They will help them understand what it is they need. If it's anything to do with housing, we can support with advice for housing. We can contact the relevant council and speak to them on their behalf. We offer a mobile biometrics team that will travel out to the homes of anybody who's got mobility issues and they will take their um, biometrics and set them up. Um, we offer advice on accessing mainstream benefits, whether it's council tax reduction, whether it's um, housing benefit, whether it's anything to do with rent, uh, anything to do with your bills. The vulnerable persons team do offer quite a bit of support to anybody who needs it, no matter how big, how small. Not only do they offer those kinds of services, but they offer anything to do with your mental health. So if you feel you need someone to talk to, just to explain what's going on in your, in your head and you just need a shoulder of support, our team will do that as well. Next slide, please. Do you want this, Polly? Polly's there, would like Polly. <laughs> Unless you can hear me, can you hear oh, we me? we can hear you, Polly. You can do number, You can do the next slide. Oh, excellent. <laughs> it's still showing on my audio um, cut, but anyway, um, fine. Thank you. Um, vulnerable per, um, individuals and assistants. Uh, we do have a team um, that deals with uh, people who are vulnerable for whatever reason. Um, and we can provide immediate financial support to those who need it under what we refer to as urgent and exceptional circumstances. Um, and we have a policy that we go by for depending on what the, the, the need is. Um, the policy may apply if you are unable to wait for a full and final consideration of your compensation claim um, due to personal or, you know, as it says, ex exceptional reasons. So um, we will do our best to help those people who are vulnerable. And we've got a really brilliant team who uh, have done a lot of work for people who have needed um, just some extra care. I think that's the best way I'd, I'd look at it. Um, the process remains open for those who need it. The total value of payments approved um, to March this year is 376,354p. So um, as I've said, we have tried our best. Um, I can't see um, what's on the bottom there because of what's written on my computer but no. um, at the end of March the vulnerable persons team have provided um, assistance to 2,477 persons so we could go to the next slide right uh, how do I apply applying to either one of our schemes um, the uh, status scheme or the compensation scheme can be done through the Windrush helpline, which is a free phone number, which is on the screen now. Uh, they are open Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. If the person who wants to apply is living abroad, uh, they can also call that free um, line number, but we also have an email address, which is also on the screen. Um, and we then have a um, assistance provider, We Are Group. And again, they are open from Monday to Friday, 9 till 5 p.m. Um, and you can also visit our the government uh, website and download the forms for um, both schemes and apply that way through the post or online. So if we can go to the next one. That's it. That's it. Okay. That's it. 
Right. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you all. Uh, I can see uh, a question in the chat. Um, okay, so I see... Uh, Marcia might be a hot mail, but I can see from something from Gal Galaxy A13. How, how soon can returnees engage with the vulnerable persons team, especially when coming from abroad? That's the question. I'll answer that one. <laughs> well, um, I would say as soon as, as soon as they are, well, they can they can make contact from even abroad. I understand, Joe, tell me differently. If I'm wrong, you can apply from abroad. So as soon as you feel that you are eligible, you can you can contact them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so what we've got is from, from the beginning of the scheme, um, 2018, We've assisted many people that have been stranded overseas and we've helped them with flights. We've helped them that once they've landed, that the, the urgent exceptional payment, it's a minimum, it's the maximum of £5,000. So we pay, we, that includes us being able to pay for flights, um, change of clothing, because we all obviously acknowledge that people um, will have the clothing for the wind, for the lovely English weather. Um, we pay for accommodation until they're settled. We pay for, uh, <clears throat> once they've got the accommodation, examples are such as you can make an application for the white goods. If you were to get a accommodation, you naturally won't have everything in it in your, in your accommodation. So that's like your fridge, freezers, et cetera. We will help people um, obtain that. Um, we do medical assistance, you know, help people, the vulnerable person team will actually help someone find the nearest doctor. We've sorted out prescriptions for them before they leave the country. Um, it's just a really wide range of what support we offer. Okay, thank you. I, I noticed that uh, somebody's asked a question of modes of contact from abroad, but I think that was already in the presentation. There's an email address, uh, uh yeah. i believe that you put in the presentation i don't know if you want to put that in the chat that email address um so that time that anyone can pay that from there um and john yes yeah, sorry so again sorry you have to put that in the email. um yes because somebody's asked about modes of contacting from abroad i know it was in the presentation but it might be helpful to put it in the yes. chat. yeah yeah um, <clears throat> i do have a, a a lot of the countries what we tend to do is we on the presentation base that you can contact the helpline, we do have a number for Jamaica. That's the that's the main one that we've got where we there's a free phone Jamaican number that they can call. I will try and put that on the in the group chat. Yeah? Yes, yes, please. I'm gonna do you one of the coming. Yeah, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do. You need to unmute. Thanks. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Um, so turn this off. Um, my question was really thank you for for such an informative uh, presentation. I'm just looking at numbers though. So do we know how many people are impacted relative to the numbers you've got as resolved? Are you on about impacted? Um, well, who, well the, 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 in, in numbers time, how many how many people do we think are impacted by this windrush uh, issue? Do we are we talking about twenty thousand, ten thousand? Because I'm I'm looking at numbers and I'm just thinking, how do you know when you've really reached eighty percent of the affected people? For example, I mean that's a really good question, and we've had a lot of strategists that have actually tried to project the number of people that have been impacted. And that's one of the reasons why we keep on going out <clears throat> on the road to raise the awareness, simply because the numbers that we predicted are not falling falling into place. So we're going out raising the awareness. What we've also done is we have where somebody's made a, a, a application to resolve their status, our team will actually ring them um, and do what we call um a status to compensation call and in that call what we sort of say you've made an application it shows that you by the fact that you've met through applied through the windrush we can see that you've had an issue demonstrating your status can we talk you through the compensation scheme and then um we'll encourage people to make 
an application through that. So the numbers are still unclear, but we will keep going until anything else um, comes out of it. Thanks very much. Uh, a couple of questions from me, actually, because I can't see any more in there at the moment. Uh, how do you define a close family member? So on the presentation, um, it, it got it listed. So the close family is your is your parents, your partner, your brother and sister. Okay. Uh, so so your children would be a close family. And your children, member. sorry, and your children. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I, and in relation to vulnerable individuals, uh, uh, when was that bit of the scheme uh, established? Because, uh, uh, as you know from our previous conversation, I know somebody who's, who's, whose name I've not got, who <clears throat> was vulnerable, who subsequently died. Mm -hmm. um, um, so when was that bit uh, established, vulnerable? Was it always there or is it new? Yeah, it has. So, so essentially, the... The helpline was set up in April 2018, and it was within months of that scheme that, you know, was set up. And I was part of that, essentially, because we came, we were taking the calls in April, and from those calls, we could see that a lot of people, a high number of individuals that were coming through, and it wasn't just a, let me get you the document and refer you to um, our nationality team to obtain the document. There were underlying issues that, so... The vulnerable person team was set up and we had lots of contacts with um the benefit agents agency so we could get um benefits put in place in payment within a short a short period of time and we would um sign posters where, wherever we could and then out of that the urgent exceptional payment came okay. so if you've got somebody that's not that has been impacted it's never too late for them to make contact with us so the family i know you said that person's past but if there's been an impact from the fat as a, from the family that's a knock-on effect then we're quite happy to talk to the family about it so what i will do is i'll check with uh the family members that i know um what did happen because i'm not actually uh mm -hmm. sure i know things hadn't been resolved by the time he passed but uh i'm not too sure what the position is um Final uh, question uh, from me, because I must say, up until last week, I was talking to somebody who said, uh, I said, did you realize that it wasn't just something that impact uh, people from the Caribbean? Yeah. So, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Yeah. You know, um, now you put up there some of the countries where people come coming from. Um, but because of this, the, the way the wind, Windrush theme has been projected, it has been, or oh, you came along on a ship from the Caribbean. Yeah. Um, and I think there, because I was talking to somebody only in the week who's been around all of this time, would, wasn't aware of this, there mm -hmm. clearly is a piece that needs to be done about uh, emphasizing that wider impact so potentially you can really uh, get to reach those people who probably... Uh, for example, you mentioned Nigeria. People might just think, uh, oh, that didn't apply to... Uh, to, to, to us. I've got colleagues on here who are from other parts of Africa too, who similarly uh, could have been impacted, but probably wouldn't necessarily know. So there's a piece around that that I think uh, needs to be explored. Yeah. Further. Okay. I, I totally agree with that. And I think that we can always say that out of every presentation that we do, that is the most one that creates a reaction because, because of how the Windrush scheme came about and the scandal that it created, the majority of the people that were first presenting themselves were people from the Caribbean continents. And um, if you follow the narrative of the Windrush shape, etc., it only ever focuses on people from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. But if you do the true history of the, of the ship, it did actually pick up people across a wide range of countries. But then also, because we are from the Elm Office, we are actually dealing with the fact that it's an immigration issue where where there was a change in the immigration rules. It then extends to anybody mm. that entered the UK out within a period of time. I must admit that I wasn't aware that it was anybody like myself. I don't yeah, yes, it is. Yeah. So, Amadou, you wanted to come back in. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. Um, my question again was to do... This, this is just really 
following on from what Clive has just said, I, I noticed that you've got a 100 million pound budget. I think probably you've paid about yeah. three million. It's open ended, Bill J. Right. Okay. So, with, with, with what I'm learning from here today, what publicity are you doing to make sure people come forward? Because, you know what, I think, I think from what I'm hearing, you've got such a powerful sort of, if you like, uh, mission that I just think it's not reaching all the corners. So, what are you doing to create the publicity? <laughs> I think that's one of being one of our biggest issues and as civil servants and individuals working on the on the scheme we always say that we it, it would be ideal if we could publicize it in you know from every in every format <clears throat> every media platform but I think what we have to be careful obviously it's above our pay grade but I think there's that fear of um There'll be there'll be fears that we we are under we are under scrutiny, and we also are accountable for so many things. the The things that we've got the the stories that are in the media are always negative, and it's hard to actually be fight. Sometimes you feel like you're fighting a losing battle simply because there's always negative negative um, information in in the media as opposed to the positives. Um, but we're working on that. Th really thank you very much. Um, can I just say before, um, there's one final question for me. There may be others, but uh, <laughs> um, can I just welcome uh, uh, Matt Tumain, who's joined us, uh, uh, was an MP. So, Matt, I recognize you joined a while ago. We'll come back to you shortly. Um, a final question for me, for somebody like myself, who actually naturalized in the 1980s, and actually, I remember at the time, it cost me more than I could have afforded. And I was very annoyed about that because um, um, I didn't do it when it was absolutely free. And then by the time I did it, I had to pay. There must be some other people in that kind of position. Does that mean I can claim my money back? So when we're looking at the compensation side of it, um, when it comes to the uh, immigration side, so it'll be under the immigration fees, if it's a successful application, then um, you don't get a comp you're not compensated for a successful application, which you that's what you would have obtained. So the answer is no. But but then we don't ever refute. We never sort of tell someone not to put a claim in, because then there's also the impact on it, the impact it had on you, mm -hmm. having to claim claim and make that compensation. And I'm sorry, make that application. So then it's a case by case where we'd look at what how what how's it impacted you um because of you making an application. Okay, thank you very much for that, John. I can't see any any more questions. Uh, uh okay. Sorry. Uh okay. So, uh, there's a um a positive thing there. Sorry, Marcia, were you saying something? No, Clive. Okay. Right. Okay. Can I just say, um, the colleagues from the Home Office, thank you very much for uh, coming along. It's been most instructive. Um, we will share this information widely. We're not funded well to do it, but we're going to make sure that as many people as need to know, does know. And uh, uh, the recording of this will be available on our uh, YouTube channel shortly. And we'll encourage people to go and visit so they can find out as much mm -hmm. as possible. I will share that information with you uh, when I get clearance uh, um, from concerning this particular individual. Uh, can I say to colleagues who are on here, if um, you would like to ask any questions and you put them in the chat, then we're happy to pass it on to the, the Home Office for a response as well. But for now, um, uh, Joan, um, uh, Pauletta and Lorraine, and was there someone else as well on here? No, that's it, yeah. No, just the three was of three of you. Um, <laughs> thank you all. Uh, it's been most informative and helpful. Um, and we will keep in touch because uh, this is something that's important to our community, and that's what we're about. So yeah. uh, we are quite happy to actually visit in person. What we do is we do a variety of um, so we do this, but we do in person. So we can actually speak to people on a one-to-one -one basis, do questions and answers. 
we do um, pop up stands where we would do a tabletop. And then we also do what we call advocacy training. So that would be where we talk people through um, what it feels like uh, and what we need to see a, an application and how and the support that we provide. Okay, thank you very much uh, again. All right, um, so that's that bit done. So um, I'm now going to welcome again uh, our new MP, Matt uh, Tremaine. And I'm going to say congratulations, uh, Matt. Uh, some of you may be aware that um, Ma uh, Matt um, came along with his um, uh, fellow uh, sort of uh, contenders for this, the, the Watford seat to our hostings uh, um, late last month. And uh, as soon as it was announced that he had been elected, uh, I uh, invited him to, to come and uh, meet us. Uh, so, uh, Matt, uh, welcome again. Um, hope over to you for a few words, and uh, I certainly have a question for you if nobody else has any. So, uh, Matt, um, over to you. Um, are you still with us? I am. I am. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can. <clears throat> That's great. Well, look, thank you very much for that introduction, Clive. I mean, it was... Uh... It was a good hustings event, actually, as far as I recall, um, you know, and I took away, uh, interestingly, took away a few notes from that. So um, there were definitely some uh, issues to pick up and some priorities that we need to be mindful uh, about now that we are um, actually in government. And uh, obviously people have a range of political views, so I'm not going to go on a big party political spiel here, but um, just sufficient to say that, I mean, I will touch on some of those issues that came up in the hustings, because I think it's important um, for your group and uh, from your AGM that if there are other issues that you need me as your MP to be mindful of as well, or things that you particularly want to um, want to push or promote, then um, it's a great opportunity to do so. I mean, it was it was really interesting hearing some of the detail um, about the Windrush compensation scheme from your colleagues that have just been speaking um i attended as i'm sure many of you did there was that great play that was on at the palace theater very recently as well which looked at exactly the issues of uh, people who have been caught up in the problems associated with this in terms of proving their right to reside and their right to work um but uh, in addition to that some of the other issues that i picked up around health inequalities so there are a number of issues coming under health inequalities, including um, higher likelihood of black women to have a less satisfactory experience of childbirth in hospital, um, the disproportional impact of COVID on the black community, and of course, the issues around sickle cell that um, you know have been raised uh, many times in the past. I mean, obviously, Keir Starmer had asked Doreen Lawrence to do uh, a report looking into the uh, to the COVID report, so um, the COVID impact. So I'm sure many of you will have seen that. Um, if not, then let me know, um, and I can make sure that we uh, we we put out access to that to you all. Um, the next issue that I picked up was around equality of opportunity uh, and making sure that as a Labour government, we are doing our absolute best to um, do everything we can to help educational achievement and attainment, ensuring that mental health services are accessible in schools. I mean, one of our commitments in our manifesto ahead of the election was about putting a mental health practitioner into each and every school in our country um, to help deal with some of those issues that uh, that arise uh, and and can you know can probably be dealt with much more effectively if they're, if they're caught earlier on. Um, of course, related to this as well is all the issues around the cost of living crisis. So, I mean, this continue when when I was out and about talking to people prior to the election, the cost of living crisis was far and away. The biggest issue that people wanted to talk about and obviously now we're in power we've got to do something about that but it there is you know um, there are a lot of uh, um, issues around the cost of living crisis that do have a material impact on people's equality of opportunity because if you're trying to do three jobs in order to make ends meet then your ability to be able to do anything else with those other elements of your uh, life becomes reduced and limited and that's wrong um there are issues as well around policing that we need to be uh, mindful of. And, uh, you know, there, we won't need to go into a whole debate about this now, but, you know, clearly there are lots of examples of where the police have not done, um, you know, exemplary work, shall we say, in terms of how they have engaged disproportionately with 
um, some communities rather than others. Um, there were also, I picked up some issues around young people that's um, partly related to that as well. So, you know, obviously the local council in Watford scrapped a load of facilities some years ago now that young people used to use. Um, and that has had a sort of impact as well. Um, you may have heard some of the um, statements that Bridget Phillipson, who's the new education secretary, has said around um, unlocking opportunity for people, um, particularly young people. Um, which I think is uh, really optimistic and a really sort of positive uh, vision to be able to um, to be able to do that. Um, better engagement, I think, with young people and, and particularly around things like uh, STEAM, not just STEM, so uh, STEM are subject science, technology, English and maths. STEAM includes, of course, the arts in there. A lot of young people um, are interested in community cultural engagement and so making sure that we're doing something about that as part of our activity around education is important as well um, and also touching on young people and engagement with the police and how we can improve how that is working so that you know that it's it's a lot less divisive uh, in, in, in ways that um, that engagement is happening. Um, and then finally, it was around some issues around faith. So um, we had said that we would put a government minister to work with faith communities in place if we won the election. Um, it's, we want to continue to engage faith based organisations uh, to help deliver the five missions and what our agenda, our programme for government is, that that's very important as well for a lot of people. Uh, and there are a network of uh, parliamentary faith champions that we're very keen to keep going because there are people who will not necessarily want to engage in officialdom, for a want of a better expression, but who do engage in activity through their faith and community groups. And so it's important that awareness is, is raised um, in whatever, through whatever channels you can, really. Um, so that's the first thing, sort of picking up on the husting side of things. The second thing that I would um, that I would say, and don't worry, this one will be much briefer, <laughs> is simply to say that um, you know, I'm I'm very much here for you. I am open to you in terms of questions, in terms of issues that you want to raise. Um, uh, any casework that you have that you need any assistance with, I will put my email address, my parliamentary email address in the chat so that you've all got it so that you can reach me if you need to. The only thing that I would say is that obviously, um, because there's been such a huge turnover in the number of MPs that are new into Parliament this time round, like myself, having not been there before. Um, we're all struggling a little bit at the moment in terms of getting offices set up, recruiting staff, working out where we can sit, <laughs> things like this, um, which are great problems to have, but um, do mean that sometimes we're a little less responsive than we might be. Uh, Parliament goes into recess next week, uh, middle of next week so things should get a bit easier in terms of our ability to respond but don't let that put you off if you've got any casework do please come to me and then finally just to say that there are a nicer side of things about having access to your mp as well so for example if you want to come and visit parliament there is you know mps have the ability to be able to organize tours for you know individuals families groups of people community groups whoever wants to to come and visit parliament have a tour and understand how how the whole process is working so i'll leave it at that because i don't want to bore your sense this on a sunday afternoon but i'm of course really happy to take any questions that you might have i'm conscious that you've got a bit of a, a limit of on your time matt but there are some uh questions it's, it's good you've mentioned about visiting parliament because i i know we had been talking to the previous MP about a visit to Parliament, which seems to have been impossible to organise. Uh, so uh, we'll put it on your agenda uh, for for us to be uh, included when you are able to organise some of those uh, visits. Um, now, now, the other point for me would be, you might recall that one of the questions at Austin was about how you propose to engage with us uh, going forward. Uh, mm -hmm. So um might be helpful to understand how you see that working best. Um, not a point uh, from me, and I'm not excluding other people, but uh, um, one of the things I've noticed is that there does seem to be an issue concerning the balance between party and constituency interests um, that MPs are going to grapple, have to grapple with. So... I'd like to know how you propose to deal with that, because actually 
we want to know that you are you are first and foremost our MP as opposed mm. to uh, a party representative. So, but but I've got other questions. But uh, um, but before you answer those, uh, Joe wants to come in. So let me see because I don't want to be seen to be asking all the questions. Uh, and there's some other questions in the chat. We'll we'll come back to one about Windrush. Um, but actually, let's take one about Windrush first of all, uh, because that was the <laughs> from you started, uh, and I think the question was, uh, how are you going to ensure that Windrush is maintained on the agenda um, um, of this new government? I think that's the essence of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there's a couple of ways to do that. So the first one is, as your MP, I can engage with the uh, relevant departments to make sure that it stays up on their agenda. It's always very helpful to have specific casework that I can do that with. So if there are, you know, if you have been impacted by it, please let me know if you're happy to. Um, and I can, you know, I can then use specific examples to make sure that it, it, it's kept up on the agenda. Um, so that would be from a sort of Watford channel into the relevant department in in government. The other way, of course, or the other thing to remember is that we have uh, an awful lot of good um, MPs who are very aware of the issue of Windrush and certainly will not be letting government departments um, forget about it or not continue to drive that agenda forward. So, I mean, you know, there are uh, you know loads of names, but obviously David Lammy is now the Foreign Secretary. Diane Abbott is now the mother of the House. Dawn Butler is still there. Ju Juliet Campbell, you know, Marsha de Cordova, Chiun Wara, Janet Davey, uh, Florence Eshimoli, Paulette Hamilton. The, I mean, the list goes on. And so, you know, Windrush is not something I think that's going to just be, you know, pushed to the side or people aren't going to engage with. But as your MP, you know, you need to hold my toes to the fire as well and make sure that I'm representing what it is that are, are priorities for you. So, yeah, so that's that's what I would certainly do. OK, uh, Joe, you wanted to come in. Hi, Matt. Um, yeah, so I guess Hi. the first thing to Hi. So the first thing to say is thank you for joining us and setting out your agenda. Thanks. It's really appreciated you being here. Um, and I guess my question, it kind of builds on your your previous response. I was just going to ask, like, I'm aware that MPs and all elected rep officials get loads and loads of uh, communications, casework and policy issues and stuff. But what's like the best way that we can, as an organization, get in touch with you um, to make it as easy as possible for you to help us? Mm -hmm. um, like, do you have like a pref preferred, like, is email the best way or do you want a structured report or is there some other way that we can help? No, no, e at the moment, email is definitely the best way because as I say, we're still in this process of trying to sort of set up offices, recruit teams and do all the rest of it. So the the, the idea is that within a couple of months, we have a system that works where we have, you know, people who are employed locally in Watford, there'll be somebody who's employed in Westminster as well, that are all working as part of our Watford team, if you like, to make sure that we're doing the casework, we're handling the issues that are coming up. Um, until that team is set up and in place, email is, is the best way. And do not be afraid to pester me, right? You know, I am literally getting hundreds of emails a day. So it's not, sometimes it's not, um, I'm not obviously ignoring them, but it's possible that you miss them in the in the sort of you know tsunami of stuff that's coming. So just pester me, and um you know I'm a very approachable guy. You know I'm, I don't take this kind of sort of Westminster distance approach to things. I mean Clive will know this. You know we uh, from for many years now. So um, yeah, just just keep on at me. Um, I'm quite easily accessible, and uh, you know don't be don't be worried if I'm not responding. It's not because I'm ignoring you. It's because there's uh, just too much distraction going on. So keep pestering me, and I will I will get to you. Thank thank you uh, uh, for that. Um, one um, other a question <laughs> for you, Matt. Too. Um, in our community, of course, we do have a a number of pe uh, people who have a uh, uh, more than two children. Uh, so you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I certainly do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, what's your position on this uh, um, uh, two-child a cap on uh, on child benefits? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Uh, so there are two things I think to say on this. I mean, the first one is I don't think there is a single Labour Party member, politician, MP, representative who doesn't want to see the removal of the two-cap uh, limit at the moment. 
the the reason that it wasn't so there was obviously for anyone who doesn't know just for a bit of context there was um uh, there are a lot of bills going through Parliament related to the King's speech at the moment, and um, people can put amendments into those bills as they're going through to the vote. And there was an amendment put in to immediately scrap the two-child limit, which was introduced by the Conservative government in 2016, 2017, I think. So, you know, which limited the number of children that would be in receipt of uh, benefit payments uh, going out to them. Um, we you know ultimately that we absolutely want to get rid of that because it's it's not fair and it's not just the reason that it's not being scrapped immediately is that we went into government on a very specific promise to say okay this is the policy program that we've got it is fully costed that manifesto is still available online you can still see it and it breaks down exactly how we're going to raise the money to pay for all the things that we're promising that we're going to do and there's a credibility associated with that, which we we just have to adhere to. And to have to have broken that credibility within two weeks of of going into office is, um, you know, is not something that I think I'm not something. It's not something that I think demonstrates our sincerity in terms of how we're going to try and address these problems. So I do I absolutely recognise the passion the concern and uh and i share it you know i absolutely share it as well i mean you know putting a, a a numerical limit on this kind of thing is not a um a particularly progressive thing to to be doing and so you know i definitely want to see an end to it um there are two things that i think are happening that are, are, wor are worth noting as well one is that in order to help deal with this and to look at it um there has been a child poverty task force that has been set up and that is, you know, that's not just a paper exercise that really will produce a series of recommendations, work out how we can move towards the removal of that cap and, you know, look at the look at the finances to see how that can be more achievable a little bit down the line, whether it's at the next budget, whether it's after that, obviously will will have to yet be determined. But um but yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, clearly, there are, you know, the fact that the amendment was put down last week to uh to be voted on shows that you know passions are running high on this particular subject. Okay, thanks, Amadou. Thanks, Clive. Uh, Matt, uh, thank you. One of the other issues I wanted to point out is housing, and I know yes. your government is set its stall to really, really sort of uh, up that sort of uh, building program. So, if we were to invite you here in three years' time, how would you say you've helped Watford really improve on that one key metric? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a really good question. I mean, you're absolutely right. It was a big part of our manifesto commitment. So we said that we were going to build one and a half million new houses over a parliamentary term. Um, the you know we're all aware of the reasons for that. We all know that there aren't enough houses, um, and particularly in places like Watford, rents and prices are you know very much higher than they were. Uh, a lot of people you know are priced out of being able to stay here. Um, a lot of the housing that is being built, I would suggest, is probably not the right kind of housing that needs to be built here as well. So, for example, you have historically seen over the last you know, five or six years a lot of uh, tower block type developments going up. Um, these are, you know, these can be their houses. Sure. And there is a demand for that kind of housing. But if you look at the demographics of Watford as a town, it skews quite young compared to other other towns that are like it, which means you've got more 20 and 30 year old people in Watford than you do in comparable towns elsewhere. So what that suggests is that what you really need as housing is family starter homes. They're, they're the kind of properties that need to be being built. Now, it's difficult to build too many family starter homes somewhere like Watford. You know, we can unlock brownfield land. We've you know, got this definition coming through of, you know, grey belts where, you know, it's defined as green belt, but it's really a car park. And so can we not do something to build housing on that and, and, and those kind of issues? But new towns as well is um, is a big part of that. So because and one of the reasons that new towns are appealing is because you can get the infrastructure right as well. One of the other problems that you have with overdevelopment in somewhere like Watford is that you don't necessarily get the new schools, new GP practices, dentists, improvements to public transport, improvements to road network, water, sewage, uh, you know, all these all these issues that get impacted the more development you do. Whereas if you're building 
from scratch, you can get all that stuff sorted out as well. And so that's uh, that's very much the objective. So were I to come back in three years time, then I hope that we would be in a situation whereby. Oh, and the other thing to say as well is um, about uh, uh, private landlords uh, and ending no fault evictions and making sure that the quality of housing is good, because obviously, you know, it's not just price, it's issues like damp and mould. And we've seen the consequences of that where poor private housing, poor housing in the private sector and landlords haven't really been held to account. So that's something else we're, we're working on as well. But in three years time, I hope that we've been able to fix the quality of that housing. I hope we have been able to make a significant inroad on the commitment to the houses that we said that we were going to build and that we're building the right type of housing as well for, for what the needs are uh, of, of the town, the region and the area. Of course, what I would say is I hope I'll be coming back to you more frequently than in three years time. Um, and, and to sort of touch on the point that um, was made uh, by Clive earlier on, I mean, how do you stay in touch? You can inv invite me to your meetings. I mean, you have your meetings regularly. If I can come to them, I will come to them. If I can't come to them, I'll either try and join online for a bit or or, or, or make alternative arrangements. But yeah, you know, don't don't sort of feel that you can't invite me along to attend, particularly if there's issues that you're going to be discussing that you want, you know, some kind of uh government response on because i'm very happy to try and act as a bit of a two-way street on that okay thank you very much uh matt um, i know you need to to to, to leave but somebody's asked a question here i better put this to uh to you um uh, before we try and wrap this up um how does uh, someone who wishes to work with an mp in the house of commons get a job in the office Great. There, that is a very well timed question. Um, so that for from Galaxy A13, and the the reason um, the reason is that um, just like myself, there are hundreds of other MPs at the moment who are desperately trying to put together teams. So I'm kind of there in terms of the job descriptions of the roles that I uh, that I think I'm going to need, and so I'll be putting them out um, uh, very soon. Hopefully this coming week, so that people can start applying. So do have a look at that. Where will they go and where would you look to see those kind of jobs? Well, um, there's a site called uh, Work for an MP, which I think is w, w, the number four MP.com. But if you just Google Work for an MP, um, that's the site that most people use to advertise stuff. You will see it advertised elsewhere. So I'll put it out for me. I'll be putting it out on my social media and stuff like that. And you'll be able to go and have a look at the. Uh, at the kind of roles and there's a whole range of roles that people are looking for they're looking for case workers they're looking for office admin they're looking for you know comms people researchers that kind of stuff so uh but yeah your, your best bet to go and have a look at the kind of stuff that's available what the range is and and, and what what it pays and so on is yeah work for an mp okay and, and nearly uh, everybody uses that so uh, it's it's pretty ubiquitous Thank you for very much for that, Matt. Uh, Matt, I know you needed to uh, to leave a, a, a bit early. Um, what I'll say to to members, if you have any questions that that you want to put to Matt, then you can always put it in the chat. Uh, as he's indicated, he has been. He's only he's our new he's our new MP, but he's not actually new to us. Um, no, that's right. And I uh, put my I put my email in the chat as well, so um, yeah. you can you can def oh there we go. Somebody's uh, Marsha has put the work for an MP um, URL in the chat as well. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. So um, we will take you up on offer, uh, Matt, to invite you regularly to come and join us because uh, uh, we do want um, really to know that primarily you're going to be our MP uh, first and foremost, and you're going to be um, your, your party representative uh, uh, secondly, as opposed to primarily. Yes. Yeah. And it's always been my objective to be Watford's representative in Westminster rather than the other way around. So, you know, so I'm I'm not going to sort of, you know, break ranks unnecessarily with, uh, I'll get into lots of trouble if I do. But at the end of the day, if something specific to Watford comes up that means that we, you know, uh, it's it's representing the constituents, then that's what I'm I'm there to do. And as one of my colleagues has put in the chat, uh, uh, Matt, you can also be an ambassador for us too. Uh, we've been around for a long time, uh, so if you do see come across members of our community, uh, then do tell them about us. Uh, we have uh... absolutely, and and look, you know, I, I read out a list of some some of the um, uh, you know community MPs that we have in the Labour Party in in Parliament now. 
when you're having um meetings if you if you're particularly interested in trying to get i mean it might be difficult to get david lammy obviously but if you are interested in having um you know experienced mps to uh, to come and talk for a bit i can try and help sort that out as well so you know uh, can't make any promises on their behalf but certainly happy to try yeah. and do it and uh, on the visits to parliament clive yeah just follow up with me on that i mean that is you know that that, that is something that should be relatively simple to to get sorted out. Uh, it should be, we think, but it hasn't been so simple up to now. So hopefully okay. it's going to get simple. So, okay. I won't overpromise then, but we'll see what we can do. Um, uh, yeah, well, you know that uh, just like we got in early to invite you to meet and we're getting early to say we'd like to come to Parliament too. And so, um, Okay, so Matt, welcome again to our meeting and thank you for coming. I know you uh, particularly being a new MP, you've got a busy schedule uh, that you haven't followed. So we appreciate you taking the time to come and join us. Well, bless uh, you. It's a pleasure to join you. So thank you. Absolutely. Uh, now, I think we've, we've done the formalities. We've heard from the, the uh, Windrush team and we've now heard from our new MP. So I'm actually just going to close to... Well, I'll just say this first of all. Um, if you're not a member, you'd like to join, I put in the chat uh, where you can join uh, our email addresses there. Membership is free. But I'm now going to hand over to Amadou, who's just going to do a word of thanks and, and close uh, the, the meeting uh, for us. So, Amadou, uh, over to you. Thanks, Clive. Um, well, we would like to thank everybody that's really, really given up their valuable time to be with us today, particularly. Um, uh, a sort of, uh, you know, guests from the Home Office, Paulette, Joanne and Lorraine, really, really appreciated the information you came to share with us and the questions we put your way that you were able to be helpfully answered for us. And also to a new MP, um, might be new in, in Westminster, but what for you, what for person. So, uh, Matt, we're really happy to have you on board and thank you for sharing your time with us today. So we hope that you continue to be a partner going forward and also to the members thank you again for giving two hours of your time today and we hope you continue to support work and everything we do going forward anything else clive i uh, know that's it thank you very much uh, amadou um and uh, thank you uh to colleagues yeah, well. uh, we, the meet uh record is now about to stop and, uh, i think um